Uh, Adam, welcome to the podcast, my friend. Thanks for having me. Man, what a cool story you have. Uh, it's funny, I, I'm a big Cleveland Indians fan, right? Guardians now, I guess. But yep. And you guys kind of launched about the time the Indians were going to the World Series and playing the Cubs. And it was kind of, that's when I, at least when I got turned on to you guys in 2016. And I remember I would, it was really hard to find good articles that weren't just, I mean, I'm watching the game. I can break it down myself, but I wanted more of the stories and things like that. And I feel like you guys came on and decided we're going to make this interesting. We're going to cater to the fan that wants a little bit more than just what happened during the game. And that was really the first time I was turned on you guys. I've been a subscriber ever since. So, uh, yeah, that's why one of the cool things about this podcast is it's a product that I've used my, you know, the last seven, eight years. It's funny. You, uh, I thought you were going to say you, you, you subscribed back in 2017. We actually launched Cleveland coverage a few months after that world series, as you probably remember. Um, but yeah, our first year we were, we were just in Chicago. I think we, uh, very good omen. Sorry about, sorry about your uh, guardians. Um, that that year, but uh, good omen for us launching in Chicago, and the Cubs obviously went on to win the World Series. But um, you hit the nail on the head. The thesis was, and this was the this was kind of where my co-founder and I were were coming from as fans. We um, grew up reading the sports section of local newspapers. Uh, newspapers were declining, and we kind of set out to do something about that. Um, we uh, it was pretty contra contrarian at the time. Um, subscription was not something that everyone just had, you know, 20 subscriptions for Spotify, Netflix, New York Times, et cetera. Um, no one really believed us. And, you know, we decided, hey, let's let's launch this in one market, um, get some feedback, see if it works. Worst case scenario, we'll, uh, we'll have given it a go. But um, things went really well in Chicago beyond just the Cubs winning the World Series. And uh, it was sort of off to the races after that. That was just kind of a serendipitous thing then that it was it was coincided with the Cubs winning the World Series. Well, I, and what I remember, I think I was probably because I was reading it during I was probably reading the Cubs articles, but it was about the series. And so that's probably what I because I remember reading it. And then the next year, the Indians, you know, again, we were the best record in baseball, won like 23 games in a row. And so it was just fun. There was always just cool, interesting articles. Zach Mizell is one of the the, you know, the writers for your guys's thing. And he just writes. Awesome. Guy. He's awesome great. Writer, yeah. yeah, he's a great writer. So anyway, I will. It's interesting. And you kind of just touched on this, but it's funny now. It's easy now to be like, yeah, subscriptions. Everybody's got 40 different subscriptions. But I remember when you first launched, I was like, man, I hope this works because ESPN, you know, I, I hate to say it, but like Sports Illustrated, ESPN, they kind of went away from what sports fans want. They kind of went they went woke with a lot of stuff. And it was like, dude, I want the I want the good stuff. I want to hear these stories of these people. I want to get to know the players and the teams and some of this stuff. And you guys really tapped into that. But I remember early on being like, I hope this works because I was like, who's going to pay for this? But you guys had a genius model. You knew you, you didn't have to have that many fans to be able to pay for the rider in that city, which allowed you quick expansion. Maybe touch on kind of because again, again, like you just said, it's easy with hindsight to be like, well, yeah, everybody pays for subscriptions now. But back then, nobody did. Everything was free and they were just collecting all of our data and giving it out in lieu of uh, in lieu of getting, you know, as paying. I, I think we did a couple of things. Maybe it was only a couple of things. We did a couple of things really well. One was we we were able to identify a lot of the better talent that was out there, even if they weren't being sort of fully utilized at a newspaper or at an ESPN or wherever it was, and sort of give our staff the freedom to, you know, try things, to go deeper, um, kind of break out of the formats that they've been used to, uh, writing AP style game recaps for the last 20 years, right? And that's not what fans wanted. And so we... You know, we're, we're able to sort of bring in a lot of the talent um, and, you know, they, they brought an audience with them. Credit to the writers for building those right, those those followings up over over 10 years on Twitter um, and, and, you know, sort of able to bring a lot of those, you know, you know, sort of followers over as subscribers in the early days was it was it was an amazing kind of growth hack for us. Um, but I think we also just, you know, from even even from a content standpoint, could see in the data the kind of stories that really resonated more deeply with fans. Um, and this wasn't t terribly novel in terms of showing, looking at, you know, traffic data or something, giving that information to a staff that that sort of exists. But the the subscription factor was really important. The kind of stories that drove, you know, just tons of volume were not necessarily stories that drove lots of conversion in terms of new signups. And so we gave the writers all the data, um, had a dedicated team of people that were sort of on call to talk to the writers all day long in terms of what was working and what wasn't. Um, and you know, that little feedback loop kind of like got better and better over time. So, um, I, th I think you, I think you, you, you captured it and, you know, people like Zach were just like so eager to, um, help make the business work. They've seen the declines at their, you know, local newspapers and such. And so they were, they were kind of arm in arm with us as, as the founders.
Well, yeah, and I mean, if you're a fan of the team and you see, I mean, it was like on Twitter, every article I wanted to read was with The Athletic. It's like, okay, I'm doing this. You know what I mean? It was like, and that was kind of what caught me is the headlines of every single, I was like, oh, that's actually an interesting article. That's something I want to hear about. And for, I think it ended up being like six bucks or five bucks or 10 bucks, whatever it was. Yep. I can't remember. I just remember it being insignificant. Like, hey, I'll pay that, you know? And, uh, you know, you pay like bat you know espn tried to kind of launch a bunch of these types of things to compete and everything and it's like well i already get from espn kind of what i want they didn't really have any extras but you guys it was it was worth it for me it was like no i that's a platform those are articles i want to be reading and especially when your team kind of is interesting at that time you don't want to miss out on it. you can't get enough of that and so well maybe go back though to the beginning i think it's an interesting story i um because you guys became this huge company you sold to the new york times for over 500 million dollars um this huge success story that you had and i think I, there's a lot of lessons always in a come up story so maybe if you could take us back to the beginning a little bit of where did this idea come from how'd you guys decide and uh, because again it wasn't like it was it wasn't an obvious choice to do this it was pretty I would say ballsy of you guys to really put yourselves out and go for this. And so maybe take us back to the beginning of where the idea came from and how you put it into, into play. Sure. Yeah. So I, I met my co-founder um, actually at another startup Strava, which is doing very well, but, but he and I were there and we we're both, as, as I mentioned, you know, sort of avid local sports fans living in California. So it's sort of, you know, not in the loop in terms of local sports talk radio and whatnot, but still huge fans of our teams. I'm from Cincinnati. He was from Philly. Um, and we, we both grew up reading, you know, the local, the local newspaper, that was, that was, you know, that sort of like fallen away for us as fans. We um, at the same time saw lots of innovation happening in, in kind of like the, the editorial space in terms of publications like Grantland, which became eventually was, you know, Bill started, started the ringer and, you know, sites like 538 were doing really interesting things using data um, kind of breaking out of the, the kind of the, the classic, again, the, the, the AP style um, coverage that, um, that, you know, kind of dominated. And so we sat down and basically said, what do we want to do about this? I think that the takeaway from Strava was the subscription model really aligns everyone around like building a great product. Um, and, you know, that I think that, so I think, you know, honestly, we, um, didn't know if it was going to work. We we wanted to try it in one market. It was really tough for us to raise money. Um, I think we'd raised a couple hundred thousand dollars. Find some talent, um, test and iterate. You know the the good and the bad with a, with a news business, like the athletic is every day, some, there's something new to sort of like try. Um, there's a new, there's a new story to cover and like, can we take a different angle on it? And so I think that is, is tough in some ways because every, you know, sort of have to refill that bucket every day. Um, your, your product depreciates after 24 hours. Um, but we saw that as an opportunity to really like kind of take take a, take a fresh, perspective, you know, every day, every week, every month, and just sort of like continually iterate until we found some things that worked, which we, which we did pretty quickly. So remember like opening day, April, 2016, we had a, an interview with Theo Epstein, who is I think president of baseball operations for the Cubs. Um, and that story drove like 15 subs and we got so excited. 15 subs was like not even enough to pay the writers for whatever a week, but it just, it was like something popped and we said, okay, we can learn from this and, and, you know, do more interviews with Theo or whatever it was. So, um, you know, I, I would also say like the, in terms of the founding story, one thing that was really, uh, I think helpful was, and I, and I would give this advice to other aspiring entrepreneurs is like my, my co-founder and I were very different in terms of our style, but also even just our skill sets. Um, and I, and I think I think I had a lot of comments going in that, that we would sort of figure it out together as, you know, even as the idea would evolve over the years um, to you know be more of a national publication, which it is today, um, in, in addition to obviously the local coverage. But, um, you know, Alex has a more of a technical background, product design, overseeing, ma managing engineering teams. Um, that was his background. I was more operational, um, had worked at McKinsey and worked in private equity. And so. Um, I think complementariness, you know, just having very different skill sets on a founding team was is is really really powerful. It, you tend to see a lot of folks that are very similar um, that go go into business together, and so I think that that really was. Um, I don't know how how maybe we just got lucky, but that was sort of I think something that really helped us in the early days to sort of be versatile um, and you know not not think exactly alike when we were, we're sort of approaching a problem. 
Yeah, well, and it helps you, you know, be able to take care of a larger set of problems that maybe you'd have to hire out quickly and not be able exactly. to afford. I, one of the biggest problems that I think that people make when they go into business together is that we want to do business with people that are like us because that's who we get along the best with, that's right. but they're not the best person to be in business with. You know, I, I built a big real estate uh, company and and the gift of all that I had an assistant. I'm I'm a traveler. I've been to 109 countries. I'm gone every wow. week somewhere speaking or traveling yeah, yeah. or doing something. And he's a homebody and he he wants to be behind a desk all day. Like if I gave him the phone and said call somebody, he'd probably quit. Yeah. But like he is so good at the back end and the numbers and all that stuff. And and it really allowed me to just I would go out and just create a mess. And then he'd be able to organize <laughs> it all on the back end and nothing would get lost, you know. And so you do have to find those people that compliment you very well. So, well, as you started doing this, um, obviously learned a lot of lessons early on. Uh, was there a point when you knew, you know, okay, this thing's going to work, this thing's going to be, you know, a monster? Yeah, I think, I think there was, a, we, we had a little bit of the question of like, you know, maybe this is, this is kind of subscription model is working a little bit in Chicago, but we're going to, it'll growth will tap out at some point, or maybe Chicago is unique in some way. And it'll, you know, this, this concept will only work in some markets where you have five or six pro teams and a, and a lot of interest, which I, I would say that that was true about Chicago. Um, so, yeah, I mean, you know, we went from one market to, to basically launching, I think it was five or six over the next 12 months. And remove that, that concept of like a false negative. And at that point, I think we, we pretty much knew we were onto something, you know, we saw across a diverse mix of markets like Cleveland, uh, you know, Toronto, we, we crossed the border, uh, Chicago, I think we were into St. Louis, you know, so different varietals, uh, and flavors of kind of that local fandom, but we saw very consistent results. I think the you know, so going from five markets to 30 was, was scary and hard from like an operational uh, perspective in terms of just hiring a lot of people and figuring that part of it out and just trying to stay organized a little bit. Um, and we were raising money, but, you know, I, I had no doubt that, you know, the results we're seeing where we're going to continue sort of in the short term. I think the, the real challenge, and this is, this is, I think founders and companies across a, a, a many different industries have, have run into this where you, you basically have one kind of initial unlock in terms of whether it's distribution or a sales channel or something that works and you sort of exploit the hell out of it for a few years. Um, you could be selling shoes or mattresses or whatever. We were selling sports journalism and our hack was Twitter um, because we hired all these great writers that had the, the following. And so, you know, at some point we knew that would... Um, deplete um you know most of your friends that are sports fans i don't i don't know about you but like they're not all hanging out on twitter they're sort of all over the place mm -hmm. increasingly spending more time on other platforms right and so um we we sort of started to see a little bit of that pl plateau um you know once we got a few few years in and um that's can be a little bit, bit of the make or break for 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 a young company like ours how'd you so how'd we, you guys push through that when you kind of hit a, a lull in that yeah i think you know it was it was a bit and i think we did this relatively successfully but started to really just you know laser focus on kind of other you know competitors brands like the new york times or the wall street journal that were doing something similar but in you know a different kind of category um seeing and, and trying to, you know, even hire people away from those places to learn, like, how do we get subscribers via search or how can we increase, you know, put, put more pressure on the kind of the, you know, customer acquisition side, paid acquisition side to, to go out and find sports fans that love that will love this content that maybe just don't know that we exist. And so there was a period there for a couple of years. And then we were sort of in the pandemic as well, where we were really trying a lot of different things. You know, we launched a, uh, portfolio of podcasts thinking, you know, Hey, like, like this format that, that we're doing now, like, can that be sort of lead gen for, uh, for the funnel? Um, and you know, lots of things kind of worked, you know, there, there was no sort of silver bullet. Um, and I think now what you see with, with brands like the New York times and others, including the athletic is, you know, having just a lot of channel diversity, you know, not be, you don't, you do not want to be dependent on just Facebook or just Twitter or just one thing. And so, I think that's a that's a healthy push to grow the audience um, to give people a sample of the athletic. I mean, you followed Zach Mizell probably for a few years before you were. I did. Um, yeah, that's how I first heard of. I, I think Jim Bowden was the other one that I was following. I believe yep. he was the other one. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, I was you know, following them. They had the best articles, and then all of a sudden they're with the athletic. I'm like, I guess I'm going to be with the athletic. <laughs> that's exactly right. But but you know, your your buddy that maybe doesn't has no idea who Zach is or Jim. Um, 
you know, they're maybe seeing the content via via Google search. And it's like, why is there a paywall here? I've never heard of the athletic, you know, in the beginning, people thought we were the Atlantic. So that was presenting, presenting even some other confusion. So, um, and, and what you, the way you described it too, is like, we, we needed to see people hitting a paywall five, six, seven, you know, a dozen times before they took out their credit card. You know, there was kind of the, a lot of it was just like having that runway, um, which is why we raised so much outside capital is to have the runway to build the moat to. I was going to say, I, I think that's one of the smart things you guys did is you had a big backing, right? You had a lot of money behind you. And as you started getting some momentum, you got even more, um, which also is the reason you were able to have a huge sell because you have to have those smaller raises in order to get the big one. And, you know, you kind of have to have those different rounds. Um, so with profitability kind of being not secondary, but not, you didn't need to make money right away. You were able to hire the right writers. You were able to put some money into the, 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 the whole business before it needed to pop it, the peak or where are you guys at now with the amount of subscribers that you have in, in total? Yeah. So now it's, it's, it's kind of, you know, it's even, you know, tricky to like give, give one answer. I mean, the, the I think what the times has done really well and they're publicly traded company. So um, I sort of defer to the, official, you know, uh, communications around, around the performance, but, but, you know, the, the good news is the athletic is now part of the New York times all access right. bundle. And, you know, that, so it's North of 10 million people that, um, have a subscription to the New York times, I believe is the number, um, and, and a subset of that have, have access to the all access bundle. In addition to the, you know, over a million subscribers we had when we, when we sold. So that's what I was going to say that. is, I think you were over a million when you guys sold to the New York times, right? Like in that's 2022. Right. And that was a huge accomplishment. I think at the time there was only two or three others, the Wall Street Journal, the Times, and maybe the uh, maybe the Washington Post was the other one that had over a million. So it was a huge and we and we, you know, we crossed that crossed that line during the during pandemic, which, um, you know, the pandemic was was brutal uh, for, for, you know, for a lot of companies. Um, we were fortunate people didn't cancel. You were sort of the subscription model, I think, worked to, to our benefit in that case. But, you know, we were not growing the way we we would have been, you know, and, and yeah, well, there wasn't much sports going on either. It was part of the it problem. Was, it was uh, one of my favorite sports moments was was the Bengals drafting Joe Burrow in, in May of, of 2020. But but I think it was it was the draft, which is which is tonight. And then it was uh, and it was the last dance documentary. But other than that, it was it was pretty quiet for a while there. Well, and, I mean, and again, you know, everybody knew that newspapers were going to be killed by the internet. This was kind of this thing that was like that every newspaper was hanging on, hanging on. And so many companies tried to switch over to a subscription model online and most completely botched it or they fell on their face. So, I mean, we've talked about a few of these things, but I mean, you guys became one of the biggest in the country. You, you said only the Wall Street Journal and New York Times were bigger and then they acquire you. And so how did you guys, when nobody else could really figure this out, including some of these companies that have been around forever, like what was it besides the things we've already touched on, do you think that really was the magic formula for you guys to build such a huge following so fast? Yeah, I think beyond, beyond obviously like equipping the staff and, and our whole team with data and just being relentlessly focused on that. I mean, we had Slack channels dedicated to when a story would, would get, you know, garner a certain number of signups, a, a, a Slack alert would go off to the entire company saying like, Hey, look, so-and-so hockey writer in St. Louis, came up with a great format that, and then we sort of like everybody, you know, kind of like come up with your version of that. So there's, a, I think the culture around it was, was, was very constructive and proactive um, and just like relentless focus on that versus, you know, we were not a newspaper. We didn't have to worry about circulation and sort of the print side of the business. And we weren't trying to like sort of work with two, you know, serve two you masters. You to cater to thing. a younger audience as opposed to people that were reading the newspaper, right? You got to... That's right. I think I feel that's like right. your writers had a lot of lean way, like they could just kind of write about whatever they want. Is that kind of how the culture was uh, or areas? Yeah, I mean, totally. I, I think we we tried to, you know, our philosophy around it. Um, and it's tough to scale something like it was basically like we want someone to do the best work of their career, which can look different for Zach Mizell versus Jim Bowden versus, you know, Scott Powers was their, our first you know writer we hired to cover hockey in Chicago. And so it looks a little different for every single person. How do we put the infrastructure in place to like bring that out of the person and make sure that that aligns with what the fans in that given market or whatever it is sort of, sort of align. you have to kind of be pra pragmatic about it, but, but we gave you a lot of leeway. Um, have, I think a, a really positive culture around like, it's okay to take a swing and fail. It's better to take a swing and fail than to just keep doing the same thing over and over. Right. Yeah. So, 
Um, and we tried to build genuine, I, you know, hang my hat on building real deep, deep rapport with the staff. I hired a lot of them myself. Um, and yeah, I, I think that was a lot of it. We also, you know, honestly, I think the credit to, to my co-founder and, and the, a lot of the teams we built out of kind of our Silicon Valley roots, you know, in, in the Bay area was, um, was like having a great product in place to go with the great content was was probably an underrated aspect. Well, it was, it was the interface was very friendly. It was very easy to read. You know, one of my problems with a couple of these other no, like similar type businesses out there, like Bleacher Report's a mess to try to read. I hate trying to find the articles to do it. I think they've totally botched it and Barstool's the same kind of thing to me. Even ESPN, it's a little bit of the app you like, you never know what you've bought or you don't. You, you have ESPN plus, but now I can't even watch the game on ESPN. It's just a mess. And it's like, you guys is really is the easiest one in my opinion, to read. And it kind of flows from article to article as well. And you guys do a lot of Thank articles you. that don't have a 24 hour lifespan. I feel like 90% of the articles on some of those other sites, they, they just, they expire very quickly. You know, I don't want to read about what happened, uh, you know, three weeks ago in the game, but you guys do articles that will catch my interest. I'll go back and find them later. I'm like, wait, what were the top hundred college prospects or whatever and it's like just articles that like you can go back to and kind of keep following up on and so it kind of gives a little bit more of a shelf life to what you guys were writing totally. um how did how did the sell with new york times come out if you could share with i mean that was obviously a, a fun day for you i'm sure but how did that sell come together yeah it was uh, every process like this at least from what i've heard and in my experience which is you know n of one but you know very bespoke um very difficult challenging you um until the until the until the sort of the final documents are are like signed and delivered you know you may not have a deal and so we um worked with great advisors um and obviously engaged with the new york times over over sort of a you know fairly fairly extended period of time as we were kind of working through uh you know they were doing their diligence on us having a lot of direct conversations meeting in person um and so you're you're kind of you, you feel very vulnerable. You're, you're sending every piece of data you've ever sort of collected and measured about your business and knowing, knowing that it's going to be, that, that it's going to be picked, picked apart. I think the, the, the best thing, you know, with, with the times, obviously the, just the kind of perfect fit strategically, I think, you know, they, they are one of one business in terms of, you know, obviously the subscription, they're, they're the far and away the leader there. Um, and so for us, like, as we're meeting, companies more in the sports ecosystem where it's, you know, sports betting is like now obviously gone mainstream. Like could, could the athletic have, you know, been part of one of those companies Would that have made sense? I don't know. But I, what I, what I knew would, would be true with the times was that our staff would be, um, it, it was sort of the best prospect for, for what we'd built to sort of continue to be the athletic as opposed to becoming something else. Uh, yeah. and I think it's largely, we, we've largely stuck to that. So well, and I think a lot of people end up, you know, they once they sell to a big company like that, they kind of lose what it's been. And I, I didn't even know until I was researching for this podcast that you guys had sold to the New York Times. I know that's a little bit naive, but I, because nothing changed, it felt the exact same to me from when the day I first signed up. And I literally jump on probably maybe once a week on your site, twice a week. I, and, and I just, you know, look at interesting articles. And so it's not like I wasn't using it. It just didn't click to me that that had happened. And I think that's a testament to the partnership that you made that that it didn't change because a lot of times it does i think that's i think that's that's right on um and you know it's it's now been it's now been about two years um so looking back they you know the times i, I think did a great job of kind of you know letting the athletic continue to be the athletic but help in lots of ways you know we talked about finding more users beyond twitter which is now x and you know they've, they've certainly been very helpful there um we've built out and this is all public record built out a you know nice uh, advertising business to go with, uh, we were originally ad free. So that was one of the big changes. Um, but you know, I think getting, getting the athletic to a point of kind of profitability, sustainability was obviously like very top of mind for, for us and for them. So. Yeah. Well, and it, if, as long as it doesn't feel hoard out, I think, you know, people are okay. And, and everybody knows that. I mean, even everything you go on now does have ads, whether it's Instagram or YouTube or whatever sure. else. So, I mean, kind of make a little bit of a pivot here, like sports journalism in general, um, it feels like there's more interest almost than ever in sports, but there's also so many places people can go to get the information, right? And so what trends or what are you seeing? What are some concerns or maybe some things, uh, some opportunities that are uh, that you see coming up in the near future, just with the way things are changing? Obviously with AI, there's gonna be a lot more uh, articles that can be produced, I would say very quickly and easily. 
although they don't have that personal touch. I kind of hate that idea because I, I've, I, you can tell when something's been AI generated, but it, what are the concerns and what are the opportunities with this changing landscape that we see in sports journalism? Yeah, I mean, I think in some ways, um, I think the New York Times, the Athletic can move forward very confident in, in the sort of the core belief that, you know, there will always be uh, a huge audience that wants, you know, human curated and produced um, an original journalism that isn't just aggregated, that isn't just like silly. There's there's seriousness to it. We know that's not for everybody. Some, you know, for some fans, it's, you know, it's it's more about like the, you know, kind of fan to fan interaction or it's, you know, uh, like you mentioned bar stools, like the part of my take is, you know, you know, one of the top podcasts out there. And so every fan kind of has that menu of options to choose from. I, I don't know how imp AI will sort of impact, you know, the broader me media landscape. Certainly I don't, you know, have a specific view around that in, in sports, but I, but I do think, you know, the athletic is very well positioned. Um, I think ESPN is obviously going through a lot of, in terms of the, I think the NBA rights are up for negotiation. And they, the NBA didn't even try to keep the exclusive rights this time around. You have to sort of navigate that very, very carefully. Um, and, you know, Bleacher Report, I think, is nicely positioned. And they've they've been evolving sort of from, from day one. And now it's more about they're kind of the extension for uh, for, you know, HBO and Warner to, um, for more live games, which is, which is great. And so I think, you know, the good news for the athletic is there, I don't see necessarily a, a company out there that's like focused on doing what, what it does, which is, which is kind of the original, you know, the more the long form, like deep, go deep. Yeah. You guys have story. kind of stayed in your lane very well, where, like you said, I mean, ESPN, there's a reason why they don't have more good articles because they're so worried about, I mean, their bread and butter is all TV, right? Like That's everything right. else was kind of this afterthought. They're, they're trying to also have a website that has attention and things like that, but ultimately they have to keep, you know, all their money and all their attention is going into their live sports. Um, and so I do think that's an advantage for you because I think people just, they really do love to read stuff. I know, you know, it's, it's, you just get so much more out of it. I, I'm a podcast guy, obviously I'm doing one with you right now. I have 500, whatever, 70 episodes in. And, you know, it's interesting though, cause like sometimes in a podcast you listen and it's just such a good way to veg out and kind of just, you know, at the gym or whatever else, especially about sports and things like that. I have mine that I listen to every day, like one 30 minute podcast about sports and it keeps me updated on everything. But beyond that, like I'd rather like dig into an article and, and really sit there and kind of enjoy it. And so I do think even with the younger generation, there's always going to be, you know, a need for, for what you guys are doing as far as, um, with yourself, uh, you said you grew up in Cincinnati. So are you Reds, Bengals? That's your teams. That's the kind of the core group. You know, I've I've also uh, I'm here in Southern California now, so I okay. uh, have kind of as married into uh, some Dodgers and some Lakers, um, and then I, I'm a Notre Dame grad. So the, that would be my kind of core. But I'm a huge golf fan. You know, I big big you know college college hoops. Like the last month has been really fun obviously with on both the men's and the women's side um, yeah oh yeah it was fun. the first time i never thought i would watch women's sports and dude i was planning my day around that basketball those last few basketball games like i was exactly. i was it was can't miss tv it was unbelievable and yeah. uh, really cool to see obviously i mean i i would go i remember some of the notre dame teams that would run up against uconn back in the i guess the early 2010s i i would i would check those games out and Skylar Diggins and everything, but it's been the, the sports. I mean, it, it is ascendant and, and hopefully it hopefully continues. Um, it's, you know, it was a lot of fun. So well, something that you guys, I think did pretty well too. And um, maybe um, this is just my own belief in this, but it seems like you really leaned into some of the sports that nobody else was covering and had a lot of people that were putting attention to that. Was that something that you guys purposefully did put a little more attention to some like college baseball, for example, and some of these things that nobody else was covering. Like if you try to find college baseball on ESPN, good luck. Like you, you have to go to the college app and then it's like nine things down after swimming and diving. And it's like somebody, this is a real sport. Like this is fun to watch for those of us that are into it. Yeah, totally. I mean, the, one of the main takeaways from the first, we go back to 2016, you know, the Cubs won the World Series, but we were actually seeing just as much interest in the Blackhawks coverage because there was nowhere else to get that. And, you know, the, the Blackhawks were not even, I don't think they were very good that year. I think they they were a first round exit. And so hockey, you know, hockey fans are, are some of the more avid, you know, fans out there. And, you know, we, I think that kind of, that was, that remained part of our ethos, even, even through to, you know, more recently where, you know, we've been covering 
had dedicated coverage for for women's you know basketball WNBA as well as college up up until you know recently so so it's yeah and there's there's an audience there and it's growing and in yeah. every sport you know it's a little different like every sport's been fun to see kind of the what what fans really want versus like what you think they want you know in the NFL it's like the Super Bowl is fun and it's a big deal for two fan bases, but the draft, which is, you know, kind of going on now is, is for all 32 teams. And I was going to say, just, you can do, you can do 500 articles about the draft because there's yeah. so many stories to cover. The Super Bowl has got like nine stories basically by the time, you know, and it's That's a right. two week thing. Yeah. So have so. you been able to use your position as, you know, the co-founder of the athletic to get special access during sporting events and to be able to, or can you basically just go anywhere you want to these different events and get access to whatever? surprise so surprisingly I, we were we were just always very heads down so uh, i wish i had like more interesting stories to tell about wandering around the 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 games and such but um you know we were we were heads down for from you know building the company for the last eight years and you know i i did go to the super bowl in in, in la when the bengals uh finally did make that um but no i i paid for my ticket so i don't know there's a little bit of pride too when you're on the the media side to kind of um you know keep that kind of arm's length uh objectivity and you know not not really go after the perks too much but but maybe now i would i would i would open up open that up a little bit more fair enough so is there um amongst journalists and stuff you know I, I mean i remember just like as a kid you're seeing there's like 10 microphones in their face all the time you're kind of competing for attention all those kind of things how friendly is it with other you know uh writers and companies out there do they see you kind of as this new big you know, conglomerate bully or, or how, do, how do you guys get along with the other writers and the local writers for the local newspapers, things like that? It was one of the things I, I didn't did not uh, sort of anticipate going into it was that the writers, you know, there is comp absolutely competition in terms of like getting the story and, you know, getting the scoop. But but writers, you know, they're traveling together out on the road together. They're sort of always together in the press box or, or the, the locker room. And so they're uh, a very collegial group across, you know, competitive lines um the, you know sharing transcripts from an interview if somebody had to go deal with their kid you know i'll send you the the transcript from that interview or like whatever the thing is so there, there's a lot of like collaboration even among competitors um i will say like the the response we got when we would sort of come into a new market was it took on a few different forms you know some people were like really excited hey this equal this is this is more jobs to go around you know there's a newspaper now and now there's now there's you guys that was great um in an industry where jobs just the number of jobs just goes down year after year. Um, other than that, I mean, it was, you know, people were like, we're rooting for you. Hope, hope, hope this goes well and um, things like that. But no, it was, it was honestly never, never hostile. I would say like at a, at a national level, the the competition for scoops is, is probably even more intense. Um, but at a local level, I, it, people are surprisingly, uh, you know, kind of, kind of collaborative. Well, that makes sense too, because even though they're kind of rivals for attention, that's not really personally. It just opens up more opportunity, like you said. If there's not, if there's another great writer, but he's not trying to take my job at this newspaper, then it opens up a second position for two of us to really hit that market and and, and you know have more success that way. Um, for somebody that's young, I, I think being a sports writer is, is a dream of a lot of young people. Like, how do you decide who you're picking? What advice do you have for somebody that's looking to get into this industry? You know, what are you looking for specifically when you hire new people? Yeah, I, I guess I would probably say something similar to, you know, aspiring journalists as I would, as I would probably would say to an aspiring entrepreneur, which is like, if you feel the call, you, you have to answer the call. Um, you, you, you will make, you'll make many mistakes. It's, it's really hard. I think I saw a tweet yesterday where it showed the number of people that pursued it, that majored in a specific field that regretted doing so journalism, I think was the number one result, really? <laughs> which is really sad. Well, you um, end up spending 12 years in Butte, Montana or something, right? Or like, some, yeah, and it's, like it's San Bernardino a... or something, trying to get some kind of local coverage and then you try to work your way up. But... And, and maybe the newspaper that you're at, like, you know, something there's, there's, there will always be layoffs. And so it's, you know, I think, um, but, but you have to answer the call. I do think like in terms of differentiating yourself, it's, it's, you know, just like prepared to put in a lot of work. Um, there's no shortcut, there's no shortcut in, in journalism, just like there's no shortcut in entrepreneurship, you have to put in a lot of work. Um, and you know, that, I think that would be the main thing, but just be yourself, um, find a style that kind of works for you, be authentic, um, find ways to connect with fans. That's the most important thing. It's the thing you can sort of hold on to across one from one job to the next is is like you're following um, when we and, kind of we kind of live in a world where you can start your own blog you can start your own vlog you can start your own podcast 
and really just put stuff out every single day. And eventually, like if I were to one day want to try to get hired by a station or something, I'd be like, here, I've got 600 episodes of a podcast. Like I've, it just gives you that experience. Do you guys pull a lot of independent people that have started their own blog? They like have like a daily sports blog and like look on the lookout for those kinds of things. Definitely. I mean, you know, we certainly did hire people that came from more traditional backgrounds. We were working in newspapers and such, but a lot of it was people that were just out there that had a voice that maybe were blogging somewhere um, and just, or just writing, you know, for them, for themselves almost. And, you know, they're, they're, they're some of our more successful kind of staff. Um, so yes, absolutely. Um, there's no way to like do the job without just, you know, you just kind of do it. And eventually like people, if you're, if you're talented, you will, people will like, that, that, yeah, you have a way of getting noticed. There it's, used to not be the case, right? Like you could totally not. not get noticed your whole life. But nowadays, if you're talented, people are going to, they're going to pick they up will, on it. They will find it. What's well, yeah. funny because you can kind of see it quick too. I remember like I'll watch like you're watching like whatever, like Colin Cowherd or something. I'll have different guests on. You're like, that guy's not going to make it. And then you hear, yeah. I remember the first time, um, you know, I heard Nick Wright. I'm like, oh, this dude's good. Like, good. I, I like yep. this guy. This guy's going to, this guy's going to be around for a while. I'm going to, I'm going to subscribe to this guy. Um, and you kind of just find the people that you, you associate with. Well, you had such a big exit. Um, was it hard to stay motivated or to do the same thing? Or, or how do you decide kind of, you know, after having so much success and, and having a big payout like that, how do you decide what's next for you in your life, Adam? Oh man, this is the, the number one question I get. I mean, obviously the, the selling the company, building a company, selling the company, it was, it was a life-changing experience um, and outcome in, in so many ways. Um, I think uh, I'm still young, so uh, I'm only 36, but you know, my awesome. focus at, the, at, at this moment, I'm growing, growing a young family. I have a, I have a, a two-year-old. And so a lot of the focus is going to be there. Um, but you know, I, I'm, I'm sure over the, over the long haul, you know, I'm start many more companies over the next couple of decades. Um, it doesn't, um, we don't, it doesn't have to be a $550 million exit. Um, you know, but, but I, I feel like, you know, you, you an entrepreneur is kind of an entrepreneur for, for, for life. And, um, you know, I'm also looking forward to, to giving back, whether that's in the form of, you know, meeting young founders who are so inspiring. Um, and I feel so old when I meet young founders these days. Um, so there's that, but I want to be active, you know, philanthropically. I haven't had a chance to do that really over the last 15 years of my career, um, at all. So what that looks like, I, I think it's still a little bit of a TBD, but, um, I'm going to stay active. I'm not going to sort of disappear. So, well, you, you hinted a couple of times at just how hard you are. I, if you could, if you could try to take a few minutes and describe what it looked like to really grind, I don't think people understand what it looks like when they hear people that are in the grind. And you said, you know, I didn't go to these sport events. I was building my business, like really share a little bit of like how difficult or how hard you were working during this time frame and what the, that looked like. Cause I think a lot of entrepreneurs want to be where you're at, but they're not willing to do what you did. And a lot of times they, maybe they don't even recognize what that looks like. I, I think a lot of people that have success like you they go look if you knew what it took to get here you probably wouldn't trade me places you know <laughs> hey yeah no totally i i mean i i came from a background where it was a little bit of like that you you in private equity you wear the workload as a badge of honor you're working 100 hours a week and usually when people say 100 hours they mean you know maybe it's like 80 right so i was consistently doing well over the the 40 hours it was probably 60 to 70 it was it, it was it's less about the number of hours and it was more about especially given the nature of the business that we were running which was there was the, you know, the, the news business does not sleep. And there, there was, which even for someone that I was not a reporter or an editorial, there was always something happening at the company, um, literally every second of the day. And then we expanded into the UK and then it was like literally a 24 seven kind of operation. And so um, that means good things can happen at any moment. Bad things can happen at any moment. Um, and there's, I think mentally that's, that's where the, the, the tax really hits is like you, you can wake up at three in the morning and get a slack about something's gone wrong or whatever. And your, your brain immediately, you now, now you're, now you're awake. <laughs> right. So, yeah, you know, the, the, the exact sort of workload, it sort of varies, but you just have to be prepared to be always on. Um, and, you know, I will say it's, it's, I'm probably a little bit of a workaholic. I, I do think, you know, my advice would be you got to find a, a kind of a, a little bit of like some, some habits, some healthy habits. You got to, whatever your thing is, like if it's, it's going to the gym, if it's like, de you know, taking 24 hours and just like turning your phone off on a Saturday or whatever, like you kind of stick to your guns in terms of those things that will, you know, help you refill your cup. Um, you know, kind of stay true to your relationships what it probably sleep. helped you. I mean, one thing that you did so well is you found something you were already passionate about. So yes. it's a lot more fun to build it if you're kind of, you probably loved doing it, you know, because I think ultimately it's a lot easier to ride the highs and the lows if you really just are enjoying what it is you're doing.
in, in a lot of ways, yeah. It part, I, I felt like I was I was working. If I was watching sports, I felt like I was sort of working, which was good and bad. But it was fun. Every 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 day of it was was really fun. And seeing just being putting out some of the stories that, that the athletic has put out over the years, not even being the person responsible, but just like creating this thing that puts out this stuff that so I was going to ask you, is there a story about. that you guys broke or did that you're most proud of? Maybe one or two that you could share. I always mention the sign stealing um, exclusive that I think we sort of broke, broke open. That was you in. guys. That was, that was originally us. And then damn Astro cheater. See, I'm an Indians fan. 2017, <laughs> Bauer was calling him out. He's like, they're, they have my bitches. <laughs> I, I mean, it's, it's been, it was, it was a crazy, I didn't even really, and you know, this, the story kind of took on a life of its own. And then, you know, people were mad, obviously they didn't get their sort of their, their, their comeuppance because the next year was empty stadiums and whatnot. So, but yeah, we, we originally, I think it was Mike Fires was the reliever who had been on the Astros was, was then on the, on the A's who was willing to go on the record with Ken Rosenthal and Evan Drellich. They, they deserve all the credit, but, but yeah, the athletic broke that story. Um, there's so many though, man. I, I, I just, it was, it was almost like there's too many to count, but that, yeah, that one stands that's out. That's a big one. No, that was a, that was like one of those stories. And it's one of those things too. It was so fascinating. I was probably on every day reading everything I could about that. I remember, you know, then they find, they start finding old clips of like hearing it and things like that, you know, and you're like, oh my gosh, they really did this. This is, this is a real thing. And then all of a sudden everyone got suspended and you're like, oh yeah, they did. And so, um, very and, cool. And you take that seriously too. I think that was one of the big things that we learned was, was just like the, the, you know, this is when you when you go on the record, you know, you have to kind of be prepared to, to you know, kind of the, just the reporting process, the fact checking process, like all that back end stuff versus just like I can go on the Internet today as a fan of the Bengals and, you know, give my opinion on who they draft. And like that's safe. But like when you're dealing with more serious topics, like having real infrastructure in place, it was one of the big one of the big things that I think, you know, a dedicated editorial brand can do that independent creators cannot necessarily. And I think that was, you know, that I was going to say it. Yeah. You know, we see a lot of these news um, uh, more so like, you know, like vice got sued and lost a bunch of money. And then I think um, Alex Jones's company blaze me or, or blaze me. Some of these companies that they start getting info wars or whatever, they get these giant lawsuits by saying the wrong thing. Like if you report something wrong, there is a level of liability there that you're going to be liable for. Correct. Totally. I mean, we, we, we uh, went through the process of, you know, having kind of media liability insurance, which is, th which is a thing and didn't know anything about that before, but you know, it's, it's, and a lot of these reviews are happening like at two in the morning before you go out with the story, because you know, you it, think that it is time sensitive. And so um, having world-class and we did um, I'll shout out Paul Fichtenbaum was our, was our chief content officer. George Dorman was overseeing our investigative team. And so anything that was like, serious accusations were being presented or someone was saying something, you know, even a little bit controversial. We were had layers and layers and layers of review to make sure we were um, buttoned up. So, yeah, well, I mean, I just recently here in Utah, there was a tech company that was trying to put real estate agents out of business. It was like a real estate tech company and they came in really guns a blazing, you know, saying realtors were a waste of money and all these things. And then yeah. they had to, over the last seven, eight years, they had to evolve. They actually had to become realtors. Well, they just, like the Salt Lake Tribune just reported like three days ago that they were going out of business. They laid off all their agents and it was, so I made a blog post about it and all these people on LinkedIn were blowing me up because I guess it's not true. I'm like, well, I was going off of the Salt Lake Tribune. It's the number one newspaper in Utah. What do you want me to say? Like, you know, and so even that, I kind of felt the pressure a little bit of like, oh, like, do I retract my story? I'm like, I don't really care enough. I, I'm not a newspaper. I don't have liability here. But it was interesting because I was just literally going off of the main news, but it was wrong and it caused a big uproar. You know, I, I imagine you guys feel that all the time. Yeah. And it's, 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 you want to be, you want to be, you got to be right, but you want to be first, but you have to be right. I mean, it's, and, you know, especially when I remember actually this happened sort of recently was Tom Brady was, was, supposedly retiring and then mm. and then he didn't and so like everybody went with the story um based on i think it was adam schefter if that's not true uh, it was someone uh, i know what you're talking about though yeah yeah he had to retract it or whatever yeah and it was like this whole thing and then it was sort of looking back like which which outlets had sort of like ran with it and which ones hadn't um i mean that that you know that was less serious because um it was Tom Brady. It was retiring, yeah. whatever. But you know, it wasn't like signing <laughs> a scandal. Scandal, But anyways, yeah. yeah. Be 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 right. Uh, be careful out there. Well, Adam, I appreciate your time. Has been a fun interview for me, and and thank you for putting a piece out there. I've I've literally I've spent I've read hundreds and hundreds of articles, and I really enjoy your product. And for people that want to uh, learn more about you or follow you, do you have a place that you like to send them? 
I'm I'm I, I'm on Twitter slash X. I'm on LinkedIn. Um, but you know, I'm around. Um, so uh, come yeah, come come find me. I'm more more and more on LinkedIn, which is uh, which is a great platform. Uh, it's where we found our first journalist was on LinkedIn. We had no idea what we were doing. We we're like, we'll reach out on LinkedIn. So right, cool. um, it's come full circle on there now. So awesome, man. We'll appreciate you, and we'll be in touch. Thanks, Jimmy.